When I'm not playing solitaire, I take a book down from the shelf. And what with programs on the air, I keep pretty much to myself, Mr. Saturday Dance. Heard the crowd at the floor. Couldn't bear it without you. Don't get around much anymore. Over four decades of hit performances, singles and albums, Dusty Springfield established herself as the ultimate British pop diva. She did have a fantastic catch in her voice. She had a little something that hooked you in. I think that's what attracts the public to, to great singers and uh, personalities from show business, is their vulnerability. You know, they're waiting for them to crack open at any second. But behind this success was another Dusty, whose personal unhappiness nearly destroyed her. Well, that night, she went back to her flat and slashed her wrist. A lot of that was the response to the pressures of fame, and also the, the response of being a lesbian and being in the closet and being under enormous pressure to hide who she was. I just don't know what to do with myself. Dusty had um, a very traditional Catholic education. It was the 1950s and um, this was before the Catholic Church really changed in the 60s. It was still, you went to church and if you were a woman you covered your head. Um, you were more or less, as a girl, you were expected to either become a nun or get married and have kids, and there was really very little um, in, in between. Her dad was who introduced her to music, with very diverse music. I mean, he would listen and loved classical opera, um, and then actually he also would get into the Brazilian, into the Latin, and of course Tom picked up on that, so she had both Tom playing music and her dad. And her mum, her mum kind of went along with it. She was very plain at school, she was quite slotty and she had sort of national health glasses and, and she wasn't a looker. Um, and then um, shortly after they all left and they had a reunion, she came back and one of her school friends said to me, it was just amazing, our jaws just collectively hit the ground. They, they just couldn't believe the transformation, it was like a different person who'd, who'd walked back in. Like a summer She said, well, I just decided that um, Mary O'Brien, which was um, her, her real name, that she was just destined to be a librarian. She'd be really boring. So I basically binned her and I, I invented Dusty Springfield, which was her stage persona. All together, girls, one, two, three. Dusty's singing career began in 1958, when at the age of 19, she replied to an ad in the stage to join an all-female vocal trio, the Lana Sisters. They had a number of minor hits and toured the UK supporting established artists. Dusty quit the Lana sisters in 1959 to team up with her brother Tom and friend Tim Field to form the Springfields. She actually learned a lot from Tom. He, he um, was the one that actually organised and founded the group, the Springfields, with Dusty. Well, the first song was a Zulu war tune with Tom on the bongo drum, Tim on guitar, and I'm Dusty. I think Dusty found the Springfields um, 
uh, a bit infuriating sometimes because it wasn't really the sort of music she wanted to sing. She was always a soul girl at heart and, and there they were singing these um, very brisk kind of country pop folk ditties. By 1962, Dusty was becoming frustrated with the musical direction of the Springfields. Very much the star of the group, it was no surprise when she went solo. Dusty went on to release 15 consecutive top 20 singles during the 1960s and became established as one of the country's leading artists. You have the sweetest boy in the world Without a doubt you were the envy of every girl But you're the kind that's never satisfied You want every boy to pass you by Now the hurt's on you Now the hurt's on you Your little scheme back fine, it's true Now the hurt's on you, yeah Thought it was fun to make the boys run And I'm sweetest boy that you had that time Sweetest boy that you had By the mid-1960s, Dusty also had her own TV show. To her adoring public, Mary O'Brien had become Dusty the Diva. You belong to somebody else and not to me. She was reading a magazine and there was a really wonderful model with the black eyes and she fell in love with that look so she pinched it. She used to show me old pictures of her and Tom and Tim Field I think his name was, it was Springfield, how she looked. I mean you know, she looked like one of them with a wig on. <laughs> She was very irreverent about the wigs too and actually hated wearing them but her own hair was very thin which are, you know a lot of people's ears and to try and once you once you perform and you start to get hot it, you know your hair just goes so it was much better to wear wigs. Each wig had a different name and it was named after the, the female singers of the 60s so one was called Sandy, one was called Lulu and then one called Scylla and her manager said to me yes at one point she just got hold of Scylla and threw her across the room she was so so annoyed with um, the result um, of her image you very rarely saw her without makeup on I mean I, I caught a glimpse of her once on a on a tour when I had to sort of unexpectedly knock on her hotel room door to pick up a, a song sheet or something and uh, the the door was opened by this fresh-faced farm girl who, who, who's, who'd obviously just been out milking the cows, you know, with a very fresh, blonde complexion and sort of reddish face. And I almost said, it's Dusty, and then I soon realised it was Dusty. <laughs> Dusty probably wasn't that confident about what she looked like, and she, so she created herself. With her trademark blonde bouffant wigs, distinctive black panda eye makeup and stylish outfits, Dusty was very much a 60s fashion icon. 
She did have a, a real insecurity about her, her appearance. There, there, there's no doubt about that. The amount of time she would take to get ready. She would be getting ready for maybe five or six hours to face the cameras. I find it an effort to keep up appearances because it takes so long. I'd rather be asleep. Um, I, I work really very hard to describe oneself anyway because you don't see... I, I'm very short-sighted, as I said before. I, I'm constantly peering in mirrors and people say, my God, isn't she conceited? And I'm actually not seeing anything. I mean, I can look in a mirror from here and I can't see... You don't see how much eye black I've got and I can't see that. I just know I've got a lot of eye black. And I, I can't see the ends of my fingers from there. But on tour, Dusty didn't always have the luxury of mirrors, makeup, and comfortable dressing rooms. There weren't that many women on the scene, so it was quite a hard life. Um, not that many comforts, not the same sort of comforts you get now as a pop star with, you know, your personal cooks and everything. It, it was uh, much more basic uh, at that time. Touring Ireland, and uh, there was a kind of a the dance hall, again, jam-packed, you know, you couldn't get down the lanes, these country lanes were all packed with cars and people trying to get in for to see the great Dusty Springfield. And there was a painted stage at the back with a, with a, a rural scene painted on the back of the stage and doors in it. So we all trooped up there thinking that those were doors, as they normally do, would lead to sort of dressing rooms around the back. But as you opened the doors, they led out to the field at the back. And so Dusty had to go out out of those back doors, avoiding the cow pups in the field, in, in stiletto heels, you know. <laughs> I remember people putting her into her gowns as well, which was quite a number, because she used to have beautiful dresses made by Eric Darnell, and, um, you know, you'd have to kind of put her into them, so they were quite a number as well. Her glamorous image was completed by a range of designer dresses from top London fashion house Darnell's. She wanted to show the boob a bit, and she wanted to have the waist pulled in to show how tiny she was, and we had a fight against that. But God cursed her when it came to the thighs. They were heavy, and she was very conscious of them. And, of course, to tell somebody like her, after having worn dirndl skirts and things, all of a sudden you're going to put her in chiffon, but you just used masses of it. So you couldn't see what was material and what was thigh. And she went along with it. I spent a lot of time rushing backwards and forwards to dolces who, in those days, in the 60s, were the only people who dyed shoes to match your outfits. And I'd be backwards and forwards with a little bit of material. And if the colour wasn't spot on, back I'd have to go again and get them re-dyed. But she was a perfectionist in most things. She always said, I mean, this is what the audience expect, and that's what I'm going to give them. When she came through the curtains, or they went back, I mean, the whole audience, this, this isn't how they thought she was. She looked like she's there, she's made it. The dress was elegant, her figure looked fabulous, her hair looked fabulous, and she sang beautifully. So we've, we felt we'd achieved something. But underneath the glamorous image and public success, Dusty was far from happy. I come out of my dressing room in between shows and I go down to the office thinking we'd done something wrong. And uh, no, Martha, the, we want you to meet this lady who's in the room. So who is it? She says, Dusty Springfield, she's from England. And as we approach the door where she's dressing, which is just across from the Supremes, I don't know why they didn't go and get Diana or Florence or Mary, but they came and got me. And uh, I heard all this smashing going on, these glasses and things going. And they said, I opened the door and said, okay, go in. I went, what? I said, Dusty, this is Martha. And there's this woman here who is having a fit.
For the first time, here was a white British singer who had the voice that could capture the mood of soul music. She had soul. Of course she did, but you don't have to say she was black to have soul. I think she had a lot of soul, and she expressed it. People tend to forget that when you say soul singer, you don't mean that the person is black, you just mean that the person sings from there. That's what a soul singer is, you know, so a soul singer is a really other color. Now an international star, Dusty spent her free time during her frequent trips to America indulging her passion for the black music. And on her TV show, she was also introducing Motown to the UK public, fronting an hour-long Motown special, where she shared the bill with her favourite artists. Stevie Wonder, The Supremes, and Martha and the Vandellas. Dusty Springfield was very influential in bringing all the Motown acts to the British audience because she insisted on showing us all off and brought us all over with the Funk Brothers. The Americans loved Dusty Springfield. You know, I mean, those songs were just magnificent. I mean, just still, I mean, they're still great songs today. just suited her voice and it suited um, her delivery and Martha Reza said you know when when you heard Dusty's voice you couldn't tell if she was black or white she always had that inflection in her voice you see shows she was on she was singing Motown songs she did Motown review she you know she headlined a tour where all the artists on the tour were Motown so you could tell where her, where her heart lay Translating the rhythm and mood of her favourite music into Dusty's recordings was a challenge for her British backing group, The Echoes. She sat down and talked to me. She said, Derek, you know, th th this guitar part here, you've just given him four and a bar, of course. I said, well, that's what guitar players do, you know, that's, that's with Count Basie Band, Freddie Green sat there for the years just playing four and a bar. It was right, it was an underpinning for, for, for the front line who had all the interest, and they were out physically out front so people could see them. The rhythm section were tucked round the back playing a kind of subordinate role accompanying the, the, the now she wanted it the other way around she wanted the rhythm section at the front she wanted the rhythm section having all the interest and the brass parts were kind of supportive of the rhythmic parts which was a, th which was a big thing with this big change actually there was a big change happening And the conga drum wasn't just kind of playing its way through it like a Latin player. She was always going on about, don't make the congas Latin. Well, I thought, well, it is a Latin instrument, you know, it's, it, it will be Latin. But she was really knowledgeable about uh, this kind of arranging, which, which I'd never come across before. And, and I suddenly thought, my God, there's something really interesting. It's really different. Dusty's love of Motown also influenced many of her fellow British 60s artists. Beatles were inspired by Dusty Springfield, Tom Jones, Ingleborough Humperdinck, you know, all these went on to become major American stars. They were there because Dusty Springfield opened the way for them. Because for the first time, the Americans had allowed a foreigner into their marketplace to, to sell records. And that was Dusty Springfield. In 1964, Dusty's growing international fame led her to tour South Africa, where she created an unexpected political storm. She had it written into her contract before she went out to South Africa in 64 that she didn't want to play to uh, segregated audiences. 
Um, and the tour started off okay. She had a couple of mixed audiences. And then it became obvious that um, the audiences were going to be segregated. And she refused to carry on. Why was your contract different to previous ones? It was much stronger. Well, I think that... I may be wrong about this, but I think that um, in the case of most British artists who have been there before, they have played maybe one or two segregated concerts. And I didn't particularly want to do that. Can I get a So the tour came to an abrupt end, with Dusty returning to the UK as one of the first artists to make such a public stand against apartheid. I think people were not always happy about the fact that she was adamant about what she wanted and what she, you know, I've kind of got a bit more like that now, you know. But I admired that in her and I loved that. I thought it as, saw it as feistiness, not awkward at all. Despite her huge commercial success, Dusty still hadn't had a number one single. But that changed in 1965, when she discovered a little-known Italian ballad. All it needed was some English lyrics. Dusty had this song which she'd brought back from the San Remo um, Song Festival, which she had kept in her drawer and she kept playing, and it was obviously an Italian song. And typically I said, you know, any fool can write lyrics. So she said, okay, well, any fool better go and write them for tomorrow. So I sent them over, she called up and she said, these are absolutely crap. I said, I know. <laughs> to say you love me. Oh, please. What a song. Of course, she sang them. It went to number one. She's still saying it's crap, and I said, I don't disagree, you know. By the end of the 60s, Dusty had unparalleled status as an interpreter of other people's songs. Established songwriters like Carole King would send unreleased demo tapes for Dusty to rearrange and re-record. And this is the original demo by Carole King of Going Back, which you can see is dropping to bits. Um, apparently, Carol King, had, Dusty was getting songs sent to her by Screen Gems, and th this was one of them going back. She, she sent it to me and asked me to do an arrangement of it. There was a certain chord in it I liked. Dusty identified with the track so much because of her own childhood. It had a wistfulness that suited the sentimental quality of her voice. Despite its slow pace, it had a universal appeal. And made it quite big. And, uh, and I was cringing after it because I played again the, uh, the Carol King which is very soft and poignant, and I thought, I've ruined it, I've ruined it. And it's still, it's become a bit of a sort of uh, anthem for Dusty. I think she had a vulnerability which gave her great soul, and I don't think you can manufacture that. Um, so I think she had a natural ability to communicate with an audience. I love the way Dusty sang the little girl. It just was smoky, it was sexy, it was, it was restrained, it was held in check, but underneath it was smoldering. You know, it was just uh, on fire. It's just so much romance and passion and coolness too, you know. Well, Don't 
Dusty Springfield, for the first time, bought English records on a level with American records. There was no question. You know, they were sensational um, records, and they stood alongside Dionne Warwick records. They stood alongside Aretha Franklin records. By 1968, Dusty was becoming frustrated with her career. Her success as one of the most musically aware and talented female singers the UK had produced was undisputed, but she was starting to question her musical direction. England was very limited in the 60s. You could only play the working men clubs or the end of the pier and you ended up in pantomime and there, there was no big future to go to. Dusty was becoming more and more of the sort of lady diva artist. She'd started off quite mod and quirky and as time went on the gowns got longer um, and it was much more middle of the road. So She was seen as a sort of family entertainer. And kissing, and squeezing, long, yeah, just do it. Aiming to capitalize on her growing profile in America, she signed with Jerry Wexler's Atlantic Records to produce her first US recorded album, Dusty in Memphis. Dusty in Memphis is, is so often appears in um, people's top tens or people's best ever album lists and yet at the time it was seen as some uh, a lot of people didn't really understand it um, as an album because it was very subtle and very subtly made so it was a wonderful chance for her to work with American musicians and, and particularly with Jerry Wexler I mean the deal was that as long as Jerry Wexler produced her she would be on Atlantic we ended up in New York in a hired studio on 57th Street and uh, that's where we did the vocals. <laughs> During one song, I had a duck a flying ashtray. <laughs> I haven't told that before. I don't think I put it down. Don't forget about me now, baby. Dusty had the stigmata of perfectibility. So when she did perform, she was afraid to let it go because her standards were so high and it might not come out exactly right just a little love early in the morning there was an element in in me that always often thought i was a sham anyway it took a lot to break that down um, that critic in me and they did it i mean they they got it out of me somehow right? She contravened all the received and perceived notions of how to do a vocal because the band is finished and she has her earphones on. And Dusty kept calling for more track, more track. And finally it reached the point I couldn't believe it. She's doing a vocal and she said, give me more track, I can still hear myself. Well imagine, she wanted so much track that she couldn't hear the vocal that she was projecting at the time. I, I can't imagine how she did it, how she stayed in tune, stayed in time, and also sang with Dusty Springfield's personality. Although Dusty moved to America following the album's release in 1970, her ambition to become the white Aretha was destined to falter. She went there thinking, well, I'm going to be the white Aretha Franklin and wasn't prepared for how um, segregated the country still was at that time. I mean, they couldn't really accept a white English woman singing soul music. It just wasn't done. They started putting her into a hotel circuit, which is really miserable, you know, walking in through the kitchen to be performing and also doing nothing for your career. They, you know, and so the career began to really dissipate and she wasn't the huge hit she thought she was going to be and she should have been. She spent a whole year just following the women's tennis circuit around the world and she was, became very good friends with tennis players like Billie Jean King and Rosie Casals and had relationships and liaisons with some of the, the, the female tennis players um, and took a real keen interest in it. The funny thing was she never actually played it herself. Los Angeles was, was absolutely disastrous for her because first off the sun always shines and you know 
I know that's wonderful, I love the sun, but it's boring if you get up and it's, you know, yet another lovely day. And the whole, whole lifestyle in L.A. is very much the ladies who lunch. It's very much um, who you know, how successful you are. I mean, they really do judge you by your film, your TV show, your music. And, of course, Dusty wasn't really doing anything, so it was kind of, yeah, well, Dusty from England, but so what? After several years of living in L.A. without commercial success, Dusty returned to the UK in 1978 to attempt a comeback album and tour. She contacted me about doing a tour. Um, she, I, I think she, it was like a comeback tour, and she was very excited about it. And she asked me to book a band, and I got a really good band. We rehearsed and it, for a week, and it sounded lovely, and Dusty was really happy. She was her old self again. She was laughing and smiling and joking and trying this little idea and that, that idea and, and turning the guitar player to, to, to turn his amp down to this figure and to put that setting on and, to, and, and this thing on the keyboard and that little drum fit. Don't do that on the drum. That's, no, 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 cross, cross, across there. On, no, no, not, not, not on, with the tips of the drums, you know, all these little... Little things that, were, that she always did, all the attention to detail to try and get the sound you want. We had a week of f fun and readiness. We did these concerts at the um, Drury Lane, the Albert Hall, and they, they were full and it was an adoring crowd. I think when Dusty came back from the States, um, she'd been through a lot and I think she'd matured tremendously. And when she came back, she threw out a lot of things like hair pieces and wigs and I think she wanted people to see her as she was. It was all her own hair, didn't bother, bother with the false eyelashes. Her current singer was I'm Coming Home Again. And every time she got to the chorus, which was I'm Coming Home Again, the audience erupted. And Dusty ended up in tears, almost couldn't sing. I was in tears. It didn't matter because there were no backing vocals, so I could just sit there weeping like a fool. And uh, I'll never forget that the atmosphere was electric that night. She knew that it was a new chance, a new opportunity, and she absolutely did not want to blow it. But equally so, she found it harder, because people expected her to look how she looked in the 60s, to be how she was in the 60s, and of course you don't, you know, you're 20 years plus, you know, more. And it was, it was harder for her to put Dusty Springfield together. It had always taken a long time. It took even longer. And then the word, just the night before, was due to set off on a fortnight's tour, every night up and down the country, Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle, etc. Um, Dusty rang to say, what is sorry, it's all off. The, the ticket sales have been poor and the whole thing was cancelled. It's my pleasure to introduce, back in Britain, from the United States, ladies and gentlemen, Dusty Springfield. Why are you wearing that veil? Are you in mourning because you're being interviewed by me? No, I'm in mourning because of all the dates we had to cancel in the provinces. I know, I read about that. I went to the paper. funeral. This is, a, this is my funeral attire, to cover my shame. <laughs> I mean, why, why was it? You, sold, you didn't sell enough tickets is what it amounted to. That's really what it's about. Um, the point is that uh, you, when you go out on a tour, um, you present yourself on a tour, you give people a choice. They either want to come or they don't want to come, and, and I hereby want to say that it was not my idea to cancel the dates. Little note I found here. Dear Waddy, my love and thanks for everything. It was a terrific band. I'm dying to work with them all again. See you soon, Dusty. <laughs> and that was the last time I saw. With her UK comeback falling flat and her US ambitions shattered, she returned to the States a desperate woman. You know, she just fell into really a pattern of... Well, in, in honesty, I mean, too much... A lot of drink, a lot of everything. 
and it's hard to get out of that once you get into it. Basically everyone was taking cocaine and going to parties and parties that would just last for days. I didn't like what I was seeing. There was nothing I could do about it after, you know, you, you talk, you try and reason, you try and offer alternatives, but there was nothing I could offer that really would change anything. I think it just sapped her energy and it sapped her confidence in her voice. Um, and her output just gradually began to decline from, from that moment. Quietly is a lady on stage. She may not be the latest rage, but she's singing and she means it. That deserves a little silence. I said, Eric, you've no idea, she said. One minute you're on a stage, there's perhaps 2,000 people in the audience, and those 2,000 have come to see you, hear you, because in a way they love you. And she said, you finish with all that adulation, clapping, standing, demanding more, and you go to your dressing room. And then she said, you get home alone. Uh, how can you come down that quick? Well, well that night, she went back to her flat and slashed her wrist. I think it was a huge cry for help. And as much as people tried to help, you know, the help wasn't what she wanted or wasn't on the level she wanted it. It didn't really solve the problems. You know, she needed a miracle, and there wasn't a miracle at that, at that stage. A lot of that was the response to the pressures of fame and also the, the response of being a lesbian and being in the closet and being under enormous pressure to, to hide who she was. Fifteen years in L.A. not earning meant that she was down to zilch. She had no money. Um, I mean, really no money. She was, you know, having to borrow money. She was staying with friends a lot. She didn't really have her own place. I mean, it was really dismal. By 1983, Dusty's personal life and career were at their lowest point. But back in the U.K., there were whispers of another possible comeback orchestrated by an unlikely 80s entrepreneur. When I decided to have my own record company, Hippodrome Records, it was, I got loads and loads of ideas. Uh, a good friend of mine who I'd known from the 60s, from Channel Motown, Edwin Starr, I was going to record him. And of course, I had this great brainwave, find Dusty Springfield, bring it back. Uh, everyone would buy records, we'd put it right back into the charts, everybody would be happy, she'd be a star reborn. Uh, I'd get all the glory and my record company would be as good as Richard Branson's and all that kind of stuff. Uh, only it didn't quite work out like that. The first time I, I realised that we'd got a, a problem on our hands is when David Martin kept making, that's the producer who took us straight into the studio, making excuses as to why the record wasn't being finished. He wasn't blaming Dusty straight off. He said, she's not ready for it, she didn't feel good today. And in the end, he, he also lost it. And then the word came like how difficult she was. In the studio, she's out for perfection. She would spend hour after hour dropping pieces in, dro dropping a phrase in, or even a single sim syllable into a performance on the, on the, onto the tape, cutting in here, cutting there, until there was, every little nuance was right. It was like assembling a jigsaw puzzle was recording a Dusty Springfield vocal. But her skill was that you couldn't see the joins. I know other people who do that, but you can tell. You can't tell with her. It always came out as a whole performance, and that was really part of her great artistry. Like six weeks to do 14 songs. I mean, uh, I know for a fact Tom Jones would sing 12 songs in a day, uh, 14 songs in a day, first take. And the funny thing was, Dusty could do that. That, that. that was the puzzling thing. I think because Dusty was one of the first female singers at that time to really know what she wanted and to go for it, she probably did get a reputation for being difficult. Um, and being a, a woman, being a girl, you know, women weren't doing that then. So, but actually all she was doing was saying, no, I believe that it should be this way. To say people found her difficult to work with is an understatement. <laughs> She, every musician, every producer I spoke to said, oh my God, it was just a nightmare from start to finish. By now, I got it all organised for her. Uh, we had a, a TV show. Hi, welcome to Saturday Night Out. I'm 
Janet Street Porter. Join me later in the Star Bar where I'll be talking to the Joan Collins fan club and making a welcome return from America, Miss Dusty Springfield. So I've got this TV coming out. I said, look, this is what we want, we want to do, Dusty. We're going to, I want you to sing some of your big hits. Everybody loves Dusty Springfield hits. No, she ain't going to sing her hits. She will sing from an album that she likes a lot. I think it was called White Heat. Probably the, the least selling one, but from a, an artistic integrity, she loved it. Uh, I disliked every track on it. I said, oh, no, 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 this is, not dis this is not Dusty. We want, you know, Dusty, son of a preacher man, let's go, you know, just because you love me, all that stuff. No, wouldn't do any of that. Well, okay, well, you are going to do butterflies if we can finish it. No, I'm, I'm not ready to do butterflies. Two minutes before the camera, this is live from the Hippodrome in the very early 80s, she's still not going to go and do the TV. So I'm virtually on bending knees. Please, please, Dusty, please, please, please. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you a true superstar, a legend, the lady herself, Dusty Springfield! I've tried so hard all summer through not to think too much later of you. Uh, and this was not working at all. Uh, and in the end, we had this blazing row, and I said, My God, Dusty, you're the most ungrateful bitch I've ever come across. And uh, she yelled something about, I knew all about records. <laughs> I, I assume you beat that bit out. Um, and of course she was quite right. But the point is, we had no, no meeting uh, of ideas at all. There was nothing between. There's no chemistry. Zero. And I was ter terribly disappointed. I'd put in a lovely apartment. I had a, a limousine standing by. I even bought her a cat. Um, I think Vic Bildings also bought her a cat as well. I think she maybe ended up with three or four cats uh, because she missed her cats. I tried everything. Even though I was still a fan of Dusty, I realized I was getting nowhere and it wasn't going to happen. The Peter Stringfellow experience was a disaster. After Butterflies flopped as a single, Dusty asked to be released from her recording contract and returned to LA. I don't think she ever understood how we all loved her. I think she was, because of her sort of personal life, she, she'd become quite introverted and sort of believed she was too old and you know, she didn't want to slap out on the road anymore. And I think she just genuinely, you know, like some people do, didn't have that much confidence in herself. You know, I just think she thought, oh, well, you know, I've done that. They don't want me. They've got all these young kids. The real loyal contingent of fans were her gay fans. It is and I think, you know, talking to gay men, they just loved her sense of drama and the sense that she was a true diva, that she was always living life on the edge. Dusty also spoke about her image, that really she modelled her look on drag queens. And um, you go to any gay pride um, march today and you'll see, you know, the Dusty Springfield contingent. She had no rapport with straight males, you know, and I'm essentially a straight guy. Uh, no rapport whatsoever. She was much more comfortable around gay men and women per se, especially gay women. Uh, all you had to do, really, to become a friend of, uh, of Dusty was to stroke her ego all the time, so how wonderful she was. Quietly, there's a lady on stage she may not be the latest rage, but she's singing, and she means it. That deserves a little silence. Why, God, please, there's a woman up there, and she's been honest to a song. She was a diva, and the fact that you know she wasn't easy to deal with, and the vulnerability, 
that appeals to gay people because they see um, a bit of themselves in those people and they're a bit tortured. And she was a bit tortured. Put your hands together Help her along All that's left of the singers That's left of the song Rise to the occasion There's two things make Dusty a gay icon. I mean, firstly, the, the music. And then, of course, the look. You know, Dusty's was made some remark in the 1980s. Um, she said, I must be getting popular again because the drag queens are doing me. Um, and she really liked that, by the way. We talked, you know, talked her back into the studio and talked her back into making records. Um, and I, I think she found out quite novel that, 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 that the new generation, because obviously we were a lot younger than her. Well, she thought we were, you know, we weren't that much younger, but just looked a lot younger. Um, I think she was quite smitten that we, we held her certainly as high as any Motown artist. I think she found that quite amazing. I think things really turned around for Dusty um, in the mid-90s when her song Son of a Preacher Man was on the Pulp Fiction soundtrack. It was Quentin Tarantino's most successful film and also one of the most successful soundtracks of all time. And that brought her to a whole new generation, a new audience. So very pleased indeed. Please welcome Dusty Springfield. <laughs> Her career and her personal life sorted, it seemed Dusty could relax and finally start to enjoy her status as Grand Dame of British pop. But even bigger personal challenges were to come. She said, did I tell you I have a lump in my breast? And I said, no. What did the doctor say? I don't have a doctor. You mean you don't have a doctor? Well, I've never been ill. I've never had to go to anyone. Get off the phone, let me call mine. So I called up and made an appointment, called her back and said, you've got an appointment tomorrow. So we went to the doctor and when she came out, the doctor was giving her a referral to the Marsden. And we were all trying to be very up and go, well, this is what they would do. Don't worry. You know, knowing in our heart of hearts that this was not a good sign. It was the beginning of a long fight against cancer. For the first time in her life, it gave her a focus away from singing. When Dusty was actually diagnosed with breast cancer, um, there was part of her that was actually secretly quite relieved um, at... And I think I can, I can understand that, because, she, because she'd been so tortured about her singing all her life and about performing and, and being a public figure, that in a way this, this l allowed her to let go. For somebody who dealt so badly with the little things of life, she dealt with cancer magnificently. Dusty spent most of her time convalescing in her house by the river in Henley. I went to look at a house on the river when we were going to buy this and I said I like the one next door and I walked up the path of this house there was a rather large lady with a big hat a big hat dark glasses and carry an enormous cat. And I looked, and this woman looked up and said, Eric? I said, Dusty. It was her, like, and she said, I only moved in about three days ago, and so she said, I can't offer you a drink, she said, because I, I don't drink. And she said, as a matter of fact, Eric, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, and I'm celibate. In other words, I'm a boring old fart. Round, like a circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning, 
on an ever-spinning reed Like a snowball down a mountain Or a carnival balloon Like a carousel that's turning Running rings around the moon As Dusty would have wished, her funeral in Henley was a star-studded event. Thousands of fans lined the streets to pay their respects. The one thing that, that I was at sure about was that it should be a showbiz funeral. I mean, Dusty was showbiz, you know, you had to have, you don't have to say you love me, you had to have going back. And it, it was, I mean, as Elton said, it was the only coffin he'd ever seen get a standing ovation. <laughs> She was born Mary O'Brien, but died Dusty Springfield. All through her life, it seems, she struggled to live with her private and public personas. There was a conflict between the two, because, you know, when you're at home in the privacy of your own house, it's very easy just to be Mary O'Brien. But, you know, the moment you do go outside, nobody else expected her to be Mary O'Brien. Everybody expected her to be Dusty Springfield. For someone who gave so much to other people, there wasn't anything that actually made her that happy. Hmm. That, that was the next time I saw her. Dusty Springfield will be a lovely person. Hmm. For some reason, I can see her on stage bowing. The way she bowed was very... I can just see that. That's my lasting memory. She's the best singer I've ever heard. And she can sing everything better than anybody else. Whether it's up-tempo, joyous, soulful music, or expressing the depths of un unhappiness. No one else sounds more unhappy than Dusty singing one of those sad songs. She was possibly one of the all-time best British female singers. Probably the best. Probably. You know, people don't quite get that people like Dusty Springfield are real rare diamonds. They are rare. You only get one every 20 years. Mm -hmm.